Good morning. We're going to kick off a service, a series this morning. Um, I'm supposed to introduce myself, aren't I? My name is David Petrelli. I am uh, uh, not on staff pastor here at the church, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning in worship and in the Word. Um, as you can see from behind me that uh, we're going to start a series called Fight the Good Fight. Uh, last time we did something with fighting or warfare or something, Pastor Andy was up here looking like a slim down Sylvester Stallone. He had everything going but the fanny pack. I just uh, didn't like the fanny pack. Um, so we, that's where we're going to start. And let's just begin with prayer. God, I just thank you that you are gracious and kind. And I just ask that you take this word of yours and bring it to our ears so that we can understand it. I ask that um, we have ideas from your spirit on how to apply it and that we move forward in our relationship with Christ. In your name, amen. So I don't know um, how this series is going to go, but um, I will just let you know that Today, I am going to be the drill sergeant. Andy may be nice, Pastor Andy may be nice for the rest of the time, but I'm going to be the drill sergeant and continue to tell you to do 10 more push-ups. Um, so, uh, but what I would like to begin with is where I think this is coming from. Is 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 12 says, But you, man of God, flee from all this. Paul is speaking to Timothy and encouraging him and discipling him in his ministry, and he tells him to flee from all this. Um, the, this is specifically um, greed and false teaching, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And he um, ends in 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. He's nearing the end of his life, and Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also who have longed for his appearing. And so um, what we're going to be looking at today is 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 through 27. This is a, a passage that most of us are familiar with. It's about being, uh, it's, it uses an athletic example. And I was thinking... Um, about athletics and, you know, who we could compare to somebody who's very successful. And I just thought about Michael Jordan. Now, I'm a Detroit Lions fan, and um, you can pray for me. Uh, uh, we did come up with a win against an undefeated team last week. Um, I'm sure we will wreck right that ship this week. Um, but, uh, but I thought of Michael Jordan. I mean, what an amazing athlete. Um, I mean, his... Over his career, 15 years, he averaged 30.1 points a game, 6.2 rebounds, 5.3 assists. He had a 83 and a half average from the free throw line for his whole career. Just an amazing athlete. And we hold him up and we look at him, and you can see whether Michael Jordan has a spiritual um, leanings or not. You can see the glory of God in this man when he moves on the court. God created somebody with great skill, but this did not come just by giftings. His success did not come just because he was gifted. And so I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 through 27. It'll be up here, but if you want to read it in your, uh, in your Bible or on your phone, feel free to do that. We're reading from the NIV. It says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly, and I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. And Paul is talking about himself in the context of his freedom as an apostle, and he's giving us instruction at the same time in the context of our freedom 
being redeemed in Christ. And I think he and Paul understands, God understands, and is writing through Paul to us, that it's easy for us to focus our lives on things other than our relationship and our purpose in Christ. And before this passage, there's a few verses where Paul says, if I'm with a Jew, I become like a Jew. If I'm with one under the law, I become like someone under the law. If I'm under, with someone not under the law, I become like someone not under the law. If I'm with someone weak, I become weak. And he's talking a little bit more than just communication. What he wants to do is he wants us to recognize what is important so that we're able to cast off what is unimportant. So when Paul was with a Jewish person, he could talk about circumcision because it wasn't really important. And when he was with someone who was a Gentile and not under the Jewish law, he could talk with them about not being circumcised because he understood that it wasn't important to being Christ-like, to getting the prize. And so in Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, the passage we read then, Paul is instructing us how we can understand what is important and order our lives so that we live in a way that communicates the gospel to whoever we're sitting around. So I speak differently when I'm with church people than I do when I'm in my office. I might stand up for different things when I'm with church people than I do when I'm within my office at work. Because there are some things that are important and some things that aren't. And I want to understand how to behave. And so Paul gives us exactly how to do this. See, Jesus has given us right relationship with God. He's given us reconciliation with God. Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians. And we should discipline ourselves then so that we maintain this right relationship with God. And this is what he's telling us to do in these three verses. He's telling us how to discipline ourselves so that we maintain a right relationship with God. We maintain a, a witness wherever we are. Now, I don't, now we'll talk, I'll rectify this or balance it uh, at the end, but I don't want you to miss Paul's language here. Paul three times indicates that he can possibly end at the end of his life without Christ. Paul. Three times he does. So in verse, 20, in verse 23, he says, um, he says, so that I might participate in, and uh, the NIV translates it, that I might uh, have the blessings of the gospel. Okay, if you don't have the blessings of the gospel, you're not going to heaven. And he, he's acting and he's thinking and he's ordering his life that he might have the blessings of the gospel. In verse 24, he indicates only one gets the prize. Run in such a way to get the prize. There's a way to run this race and not get the prize. This is the conclusion. And then at the end, he says, I strike a blow to my body and I make it my slave so that I will not be disqualified myself. Do not miss this language. If you are a, I am a once saved, always saved person. But do not miss this language. My theology cannot adjust what Paul is saying here, and he is leaving open the door that he might be disqualified for heaven. And so he tells us what to do so that we can be assured. And in verse 24, he says, you have to start and you have to continue. You have to enter, right? Every, all the race in the, uh, know that all in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. So you got to get in the race, right? You have to enter the race. So step one is we need to be saved by faith in Christ Jesus. We need to express our sin to him in repentance and recognize that we cannot forgive ourselves and say, God, Father God, forgive me. 
Save me by the blood of Jesus Christ who makes me clean and pure. Apply to my life his righteousness that he earned while he was on this earth and lived a perfect life. Give that to me as well. I am a sinner and I need you. We need to enter the race first. We need to do that. And then we need to continue. So we have to get into the race, and we have to run the whole race. Okay? So we have to grow. We have to um, have endurance. Uh, and, and I want you to notice in the verses that I read in, in, in Timothy, it said, um, Paul tells Timothy, um, pursue endurance. And Paul says to himself, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, I have endured. We have to run the whole race. We can't just run part of it. We have to get to the finish line. And we have to run the race in a way that gets us the prize. Everybody knows, well, maybe not anymore, I don't know the story of the tortoise and the hare, right? The hare has all the, all the skills and he's fast and the turtle doesn't and the turtle ends up winning because the hare doesn't run the race in a way to win the prize. And oftentimes that's what we want, right? We want the quick, we're going to get through this, we're going to do it, but life, as most of us understand as we live it, it's more like the tortoise just plodding along and doing the best we can. But we have to run in such a way that we win the prize. And this discipline that maintains right relationship with God requires that we start and continue. I don't know if any of you have, uh, have daughters or have had daughters. I had two daughters, and uh, now the baby's uh, 25 or 26, and... Um, but when they were little, they were, we were in dance. Talk about a commitment. My goodness. Dance is a commitment. I mean, you've got to be there for rehearsals. You've got to sit through six hours of dance routines to see your little one do a three-minute routine. It is a commitment. You've got to buy outfits. You've got to pay for travel expenses. You got, it is a commitment. You're in, you're in for the long haul. And this is what Paul is telling us, is that we need to make a commitment to this. We're going to enter the race. We need to make a commitment to our salvation, not just to enter the race and ride it out. We need to make a commitment to the salvation so that we run the whole race and we run it in such a way as we are in the kingdom when it's all over. We need to make a commitment to ourselves. We need to make a commitment to others. This is not a race we brought. We run on our own. We need to make a commitment to our faith community and the people in it. And we need to hang on when things get rough. The discipline that maintains the right relationship with God requires that, first of all, we start it and we continue in it till it's done. Verses 25 and 26, discipline that maintains a right relationship with God requires that we live our life with purpose, our spiritual lives with purpose. This is a hard thing for us in America to live our spiritual lives with purpose. And um, Paul says, um, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. Some of you might have discipline, uh, goes uh, under discipline there. Uh, the idea is, um, it, from the original text, is that everyone who competes in the games, okay, um, has to master themselves. And they do it for a purpose, to win a crown that lasts for forever. The, the crown, crown that Paul, Paul talks about in 2 Timothy, Timothy, the crown of righteousness. This is a fixed goal. 
right relationship with God turns into mature relationship with God and brings glory to his character. And when we end, we have the prize, the crown of righteousness. We don't run around like Forrest Gump. I'm just going to choose to run and run. Right? That's what he did. If you know the movie, he just, uh, his life wasn't going anywhere. He just chose to run. Unfortunately, it's easy for us to run our Christian lives like Forrest Gump. We're just going to run. I'm going to go to church, and I'm going to work, and I'm just going to run. But we're called to a purpose. God has not saved us just to bring us into heaven. God has, in fact, all of us. And I know this is hard for my wife Cindy to grab on to, but all of us have been saved for a specific purpose in God's kingdom. This is why in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about the body. We all have a role and a purpose. Some people play music. Some people mow the grass. Some people teach. Some people take care of babies. Some people set, cook food. Other people deliver it. We all have a purpose, and we need to live our spiritual lives with purpose, not just our material lives with purpose. We're not just to run around. We're not just to box in the air. We are to run with God's given purpose. And that purpose is to govern our activity and our direction. It's to decide what takes place in our material life. We live a life of purpose to get this crown that will last forever. Part of Michael Jordan's success was not just his giftings. He would have not had the success without living with the purpose to win. To win basketball games. To win championships. In the off-season, off-season, five hours a day, five days a week on skills only. That's why he was good. Because he worked. And then he also viewed film, and he did other things. Game day routines, same thing. Began in the morning with a workout. Structured routine. Michael Jordan is one of the, one of the um, modern athletes. He, he's, I think he created the modern game of basketball. But he's one of the modern athletes who didn't suffer a ton of injuries because he purposely received treatment, and stretches and exercises on vulnerable areas of the body to a basketball player. And he would go through those pre-game and post-game. He didn't sit in ice tubs or anything like that. He did these exercises and strengthened these vulnerable areas. He lived his life with purpose, and his days were ordered by this purpose to win basketball games. This is what Paul is telling us to do with our spiritual lives. Live our lives with purpose. Do we even know? Many people don't even know what their calling is. What has God called me to do in this place at this time? Now, I didn't grow up in the Baptist church. Um, I grew up in a Presbyterian church in the Midwest and an Assemblies God church. And um, so when I first started going to a Southern Baptist church in Nashville, Tennessee, um, I found out about a few things. I found out about, first of all, camp. I never went to youth camp in the summer. An awesome thing. I've done a, I'd, I'd led a lot, but I never had gone to one as a youth. And I also found out that that's where you get your calling, and that's where it is for the, end, for the rest of your life. Not really. But that's something I struggled with. I, don't, I didn't get this calling. How do I know what I'm supposed to do? That's not what our calling is about. Our calling, I think, changes as our life changes. Would you agree, Pastor? Yeah. And, um, and so we would, um, so what is your calling now, right now, in this place, for this time? 
What has God called you to do? It doesn't have to be something, um, something that's complicated. It doesn't have to be something that a lot of people will see. It just has to be what God is calling you to do. What is your, your purpose in God's kingdom? God has a purpose for you. Even if you don't know what it is, he has a purpose for you. We need to find the answers to those questions. And then we will know how to order our lives to achieve that purpose. And then we will set up our spiritual life. We will set up our daily routines. We will set up our weekly activities based on what God has called us to do. I will set up my prayer life based on what God has called me to do. I will set up my study life based on what God has called me to do. I will be involved in whatever activities I need to be involved in during the week based on what God has called me to do. My schedule, when, when I get up in the morning, is determined by what God has called me to do, not determined by what time I have to be at work. When I go to bed at night, is determined by what God has called me to do. And Paul is telling us that we go into strict training and we go in for a specific purpose. So discipline that maintains a right relationship with God requires that we start and we continue and that we live life with purpose. And lastly, the most difficult part, I think, and something that we don't know how to do because we don't know how to live with purpose is we subdue ourselves. He says in verse 27, now I strike a blow at my body and make it my slave so I will not be disqualified. We subdue ourselves. Romans 6, 13 and 19 talks about us offering ourselves to God as slaves of righteousness. We strike a blow to our body. Our bodies and our desires are not evil in and of themselves, but they must be subdued to follow the right master because we will not follow the right master with our bodies and desires naturally. And we must subdue our body to follow the right master. The Christian life involves a, a wisdom directed enjoyment and limitation of our freedoms in Christ. Our freedoms in Christ are not given to us so we can just go out and be free. When we know our purpose, we are to make our bodies submit, and that means some of our freedoms we are going to limit, and some of our freedoms we are going to enjoy based on who, who we are around and how we need to influence the, the people and the cultures that we are involved with. Now here's where I want to come back to where Paul three times indicated that he could forfeit the prize. Now from my theological perspective, there is not a danger of losing your salvation when you have it from my theological perspective. But I tell you, there is a danger of proving you don't have your salvation by the way you've lived your life. And we often think that that danger exists in rampant sin, but it's not the case. People who are reconciled to God order their lives after God. They start they stay, continue with commitment, they live with purpose, and they force their body into submission to Christ. And it's a hard thing to do. Martin Luther was a great monk. He sat in his monastery, he prayed, he studied. 
He deprived himself of food. He deprived himself of sleep. He deprived himself of, of, uh, of warmth. He would often sleep without a blanket in the bitter cold to submit his body. He whipped himself regularly, which is what monks did in his time, to bring his body into submission. These are not helpful. And when he came to his senses in the scripture, he said this. He said, I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that through which uh, we, have, uh, we are given a righteous life by the gift of God, namely faith. So hang on to that because now I'm going to hit you again. The righteousness of God is that, through, is that through which the righteous life lived as a gift from God through faith. But, and I know uh, when I was doing this, I thought this is, I think, the third time that I've used this application in the last three times I've preached. So that... Um, well, you might think I'm going senile, but I would, the conclusion I would draw is that God thinks this is important. And we don't have it yet. The disciplines of the Christian life, the disciplines of spiritual life in general, have to be practiced by believers. They have to. We are at a point in our world, and I don't know if Jesus is coming back soon or he's coming back 100 years from now. I think of the coronavirus and I think of the Black Plague, and I'm sure the Black Plague was worse, and I'm sure they thought Jesus was coming back. But our place socially in this world is changing. We have to learn to practice the disciplines, and the disciplines are more than just reading and studying the Bible. The, 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 the mode of the practice is I am denying my physical self for spiritual gain. I'm not going to whip myself like Martin Luther. I'm not going to get out and get frostbite because I slept without a blanket. But I'm going to deny myself when it's Bible, when it's Bible study, I need to do my own personal Bible study, and I'm busy, and I don't have time, and I'm sleepy, and this gets boring, and trust me, Bible study gets boring. It's normal. Then I'm going to deny my desires, I'm going to deny my physical wants in order to practice my study. When I, can't, when I go to pray, I am going to deny my sleepiness and my desire to go to bed. I'm going to deny my wandering mind the, um, to take me away, and I'm going to focus on prayer. When it comes time to serve, I'm going to deny my normal schedule. I'm going to deny my wants, my desires, so that I can serve. And I'm going to encourage you, as I've done, I think, the last three times I've preached, to fast. To fast. And God uses this in a special way. And you've denied something that your body, I mean, it doesn't look like I need food, but my body tells me I need food all the time. And my stomach's growling, and I say no to my stomach. And I remind myself that there are things in my life that I need to say no to that are nagging at me just like my stomach. And so as I fight the hunger and make a stand, I am not going to eat 
it forces me to look at my spiritual life and say, I need to make a stand. I'm not going to do this either. And God uses this in our lives to develop our spiritual lives. We have to learn to subdue ourselves. We just have to. So to maintain our relationship with God, because I don't want to lose Paul's talking about possibly being disqualified, we need to start a relationship and we need to commit to it and continue in it, even when it feels broken and unretrievable. We need to find out what God has purposed for us in this time, this life right now, and order our lives after it. And we need to subdue our physical desires and our body and make it submissive to Christ. And I know I've probably said this as well. There, there just, there is... There is no shortcut through these things. This just has to be done. And it's so serious that Paul tells the Corinthians he doesn't want to be disqualified by not doing this and not see God. Let's pray. Lord, you are King of kings and Lord of lords. I ask that you encourage us in our hearts to know that you love us and to not doubt that because you do love us. You gave up your son for us. He shed his blood. When we were enemies, when we didn't know, when we didn't want you, you made that sacrifice for us. There's no doubt that you love us. And I personally, God, I don't think you're an Indian giver. I think once you give us something, we have it. But give us the courage to order our lives around what you've called us to do, to stay committed to what we started with when we first got saved, or to start and be saved today and begin that relationship with you. Grant us the courage to subdue our physical selves and bring it into submission to your awesome will for us. We put our lives and our hopes and our dreams in your hands, for you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen.